Good morning, guys. I trust that you are having a great day. Uh, Minister Tiwa, that was an awesome, awesome time in prayer. One voice as usual, awesome time in worship. Uh, Tosin, thank you for those announcements. I just want to give us an update on where we are as a community, as a church in this season. As you're no doubt aware, most of our cities and towns have been shut down for the last eight to nine weeks and of course that has affected our ability to worship together physically we have worshiped together um, online and on social media platforms on zoom and all of these wonderful technology but physically we have been unable to meet and if you're paying attention to the news you realize that things are starting to open up again things are starting to uh, move towards getting us back to normal and I'm sure some of us have heard that some churches are starting to meet again physically based off very strict criteria being issued by the various local authorities. Now, we have been told by Farmers Branch where we are located that we can actually resume physical services. We can start to gather together again physically, but, on, but only if we're able to meet certain criteria that they believe would make it safe for all of us and the truth the truth my brothers and sisters that we as a community are not able to meet these requirements our church was already bursting at the seams before the shutdown happened we were running two services for the adults and to say that the children's department was full is a gross understatement in order for us to meet the requirements that have been laid out we would have to hold at least eight services every Sunday. And we just don't have the, the operational capacity to do that at this point. Having said that though, after consulting with our leadership team and seeking the advice of knowledgeable experts, it is very clear to us that these requirements as given by the local authorities are still not enough. They're not enough to guarantee our safe assembly. We've had too many cases of the virus spreading when large groups of people gather in small spaces. So New Covenant House will not be reopening its uh, physical doors in a, in a hurry. We are going to be very deliberate and we're going to be cautious because we are concerned with not just your spiritual and emotional well-being, but also your physical health. We take it very seriously. The Bible says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. It would be a dereliction of duty for us to rush and reopen and put everybody in danger. And we're just not going to do that, at least not yet. The good news, the good news is that our new church building project has not stopped. The construction has continued and we have made significant progress in spite of the pandemic. So while we were observing social distance, the construction workers have kept on building. Let's just watch this video really quick.
since we last gathered, as you can see, the parking lot has been completed, the plumbing has been done, the foundation has, has been completed, it's finished, the steel frame is almost finished, the wood frame would be done in a, the next couple of weeks, the weather permitting, and the forecasts are telling us that uh, we're going to have nice weather for the next couple of weeks. By the grace of God, I am expecting that the building will be completed by the end of September or the first two weeks of October. And that way, we can all, you know, gather in a space that was custom built for us, that works for us, and that allows us to, to have service in a way that we're comfortable and the children are comfortable and the name of the Lord can be glorified. But while we're still observing social distance, we have, we're putting together an event that will allow us to see each other physically but safely on the 26th of June. We're calling it Pop On By. And the idea is a, a drive-through or a, a drive-by live worship experience. Uh, more details will be on the app. I hope that you are praying along with us. I hope that you are praying that this uh, 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 pandemic will come to an end, that this lockdown will come to an end, but safely, safely. I do not want us to rush and then regret, you know, our, our choices and our decisions. Like I said earlier, your safety is a priority for me. It is a priority for the leadership of this church and we will do everything possible to make sure that we are keeping this promise that we are making to you. Amen. This morning, I am starting a sermon series called The Goodness of God. And over the next few weeks, we shall be looking at Psalm 23 and all the different ways that God is truly good to us. You know, when I first started going to church, one of the things that I saw Christians doing that I just didn't quite get initially was that either the pastor or, or the person leading worship or, or some guy, you know, would come on the stage and would shout out very loudly, uh, God is good. And the congregation, you know, automatically would shout back all the time. Then he will say all the time and the folks would then say, God is good. You know, that is one of those things that, uh, uh, that we do in church that many people think about, that I thought about, and I asked myself, as I'm sure some of us ask ourselves, is that really true? Is God really good all the time? What about those times when we are, we are hurting, when we're in pain? Or, or those times when my wife and I are yelling at each other? Or, or those times when I can't pay my bills and I just don't know what I am going to do. Those times when the mortgage is late and the creditors are starting to call. Or, or those times when I get called from my child's school saying that my child again is being difficult. Is God good all the time? How do I say God is good all the time when there are times that I don't feel his goodness? I don't experience his goodness. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says in the book of Psalm uh, 100 and verse 5, the, the Living Bible translation, it says, The Lord is always good. Hallelujah. The Lord is always good and loving and kind. And his faithfulness goes on and on to each succeeding generation. The Lord is always, turn to the person sitting or standing next to you and say, always. And if there's nobody sitting or standing next to you, say to yourself, call out your name. Say Femi or whatever your name is. I know there's a Femi out there that the Lord is trying to tell you this morning. My brother, my sister, because sometimes, you know, women are called Femi. Say to yourself, the Lord is always good. He is always loving and kind. And his faithfulness goes on and on to each succeeding generation. When the Bible says the Lord is always good, it means that there is never a time when the Lord is not being good. There is never a time when the Lord is not being loving and kind. He is always good. 
It is the Bible that is saying this. It is not my opinion that is saying it. It is not my intellect that is saying it. It is not my desire to, to appease you that, it is, that is saying it. It is the word of God. And, and the Bible tells us, let God be true and every man a liar, every experience a liar. God is good all the time. But if, if we are honest, if you are honest, you will admit that we struggle with that idea. Our experience sometimes contradicts that idea. And if I am going to be honest with you, this is something that I have struggled with. And what I want to share with you this morning is what I learned in my desire to come to the truth. You see, the problem is not that God is not good all the time. The problem I have discovered is that we often forget the goodness of God. Like the Israelites in the book of Exodus, when they reached the Red Sea and they heard the hoof beats and the sound of the chariots of Pharaoh's army, they forgot that God had been good to them when he delivered them from Egypt. They forgot that God had protected them when the angel of death killed the firstborn of all the Egyptians in the land. They forgot that while they were in Goshen, they did not experience any of the plagues that befell the Egyptians. And when they got to Mara, they forgot the Red Sea crossing. They forgot how with the sound of the chariots of Pharaoh and the hoofbeats of his army was behind them. They forgot how a mighty wind came and caused the Red Sea to part before them and how they walked through the Red Sea on dry land. They forgot that miraculous event. They forgot the songs of praise that they sang when it happened. They forgot the testimonies that they shared at that deliverance. They were so engrossed with the challenges of today, they forgot the goodness of God that they experienced yesterday. And they started to ask themselves, is God really good all the time? Have you forgotten how God has been good to you? Have you forgotten the blessings of yesterday because of the challenges of today? Have you forgotten how God brought you out of poverty, out of sickness, out of, of, of depression, out of anxiety? Have you forgotten all the prayers that you prayed that God answered for you? When you applied for that job and you were not sure you were going to get it, you knew that your resume was sketchy. You knew that you were not fully qualified and you lifted up your voice to heaven and you said, God, have mercy on me. Be good to me. And you went into that interview and the interviewer asked you questions that you were prepared for and you aced the interview and you got that job. They offered you more money than you could ever imagine, more money than you expected. And you talked about how God is good. Have you forgotten when you were alone and you wanted to get married and God brought somebody beyond your expectation, somebody above your, 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 your level, as we would say. You know you married up. <laughs> I'm talking to somebody out there. You know that the person you married is, is better than you could have hoped for. And you said to yourself, oh, wow. God is a good God. Have you forgotten when you got to the visa office and you stood in line and people were telling you, oh, if you don't have this and you don't have that and, and, and you're not going to get this visa. And you go and sit down in front of that interviewer and she doesn't ask you any questions. She just says, come back tomorrow and pick up your visa. Have you forgotten when you applied for a mortgage and your credit score was not as it should be and your, uh, uh, your, your, your down payment was not exactly what you thought you needed, but somehow your mortgage was approved. Over and over and over and over, God has shown himself to be good. Have you forgotten when you could not pay your rent and somebody from nowhere sent you money to pay your rent? Have you forgotten the goodness of God? You know, I ask this question because it is a really important question. You see, when we forget the goodness of God, certain things happen. And if you're not sure, if you're saying, sitting there 
or wherever it is you are, saying, well, have I really forgotten the goodness of God? I want you to check for the following things that I'm going to share with you. The first thing that happens is that when you have forgotten the goodness of God, you start taking credit for the things that God did for you. The things that God has done in you, through you, and with you. And the problem is that when you are confronted with a challenge that appears beyond your ability, because you have forgotten the goodness of God, you very quickly lose hope. You know, I, I, I remember one time I was in Lagos, Nigeria, on the west coast of Africa, and I was traveling to Austria uh, uh, in, 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 in Western Europe. And I remember that I got to the airport just in time for my flight. And I sat down, okay, well, I, I, I went in early to the airport to check in my baggage, to check in my, my luggage. And um, I had a lot of excess luggage because I, I took with me a lot of books, a lot of, you know, books that I wanted to read while I was on this trip. So my luggage was heavy, but, you know, I had favor and I didn't have to pay anything to, to get my luggage checked in. So I got to the airport later in the evening and I was waiting for, you know, for the flight to, to board. And somebody walks up to me and, and says, sir, what is your name? And he took my name down. Now, in those days, you know, we traveled very formally. I was wearing a, a suit. Uh, I remember it was a navy blue suit and a very nice navy blue suit that my mother had bought for me and a, and a white shirt. I wasn't wearing a tie. I was wearing dress shoes. You know, I sat down in that airport looking like a million dollars. Hallelujah. And this guy walks to me, up to me and says, Sir, uh, what is your name, sir? You know, and I tell him my name and he writes my name down. And guess what? I had forgotten the favor of God in the afternoon. So I started to worry. Was he writing my name down because there was a problem? Was he writing my name down because they shouldn't have allowed me to uh, put that much luggage on the flight without paying a fee? I started to worry. I forgot the favor of God. Anyway, when it's time for us to board and I get to the gate, this man comes back and he says, Sir, can I have your boarding pass? You can imagine my panic. Oh my God, they're not going to let me on this flight. But what can I do? I give him my boarding pass. In those days, there was no electronic boarding pass. It was all paper. I gave him my boarding pass. Guess what he did? He gave me another boarding pass and it was a business class boarding pass. I was upgraded from economy very cheap coach. I was upgraded to business class. It, this was beyond my imagination. So in one day, I had experienced favor with my luggage and then I was experiencing favor with what part of the plane I sat on. So I walked into that plane like the million dollars that I looked. Amen? But guess what? I forgot. Anyway, let me move on. You see, when you forget the goodness of God, you expose yourself to a situation where God may have to show you how little faith you have. You expose yourself to a situation where you are vulnerable to anxiety and fear. You must always remind yourself of the goodness of God in your life. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 4th chapter and the 7th verse, says, what do you have? That God hasn't given to you. And if all you have is from God, why do you act as though you were so great? As though you accomplished it all on your own. Everything you have in your life, you owe to God. You could not take your, take your next breath if it weren't for the goodness of God. Everything in your life, the ability to see, the ability to hear, the ability to eat, the ability to, to move, the ability to think, you know, in, in philosophy, there's a, there's a saying, it says, uh, cogito ago sum, that is Latin for I think, therefore I am. Your ability to think is because of the goodness of God. Your ability to be is because of the goodness of God. Every ability, everything that you are is God that has given it to you. You know, what was interesting when I got on the flight and I mentioned to one of my friends why, you know, that, oh, I got, you know, I got bumped. You know what he said to me? He said, well, I don't know, you can spiritualize it, 
But the truth is, I think it was simply because you were wearing a suit. That is why you got bumped. You see, the minute he did that, I stopped thinking about it as an act of favor. I started thinking that, you know what, maybe, maybe, you know, it's because I wore a suit. Maybe the next time I fly, I should wear a suit. And guess what? The next time I flew, I wore a suit. Guess where I sat? In the back of the plane next to the lavatory. Hallelujah. It wasn't nice. Anyway, the second thing that happens when I forget the goodness of God is that I stop asking God for help because I stop trusting God. You see, that's a big problem because when you, when you forget how God good is, you start depending on yourself and you stop asking God for things in prayer and then you stop praying and you stop trying to connect with God. You stop trying to maintain your relationship with God and you start to dry up spiritually and then eventually you dry up emotionally. The less you ask, the less you receive and the smaller and smaller your faith gets until you find yourself unable to ask God in prayer when you really need help the most. And, and if you, you, you struggle to finally ask, the fear and the anxiety does not go away because guess what? You don't really trust God. And like happened to me concerning the, the upgrade, you, 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 you realize that you are suffering from anxiety and fear because you don't trust God. You know, I believe that the devil encourages this cycle. That is why every time something good happens, there is a voice in your head. And for me, it was a friend that questions whether it is really God or it is just because you wore a nice suit. And when that question comes, it's a subtle thought. But the enemy tries to undermine our walk with God. So I learned the hard way. I learned by sitting in coach next to the lavatory on an 8-10 hour flight. That it is the favor of God, not my suit, that moves me, that promotes me. That takes me from one level to the next level. The Bible says in the book of James chapter 1 verse 16. It says, don't be deceived. Turn to the person standing or sitting next to you. It says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is not from your suit. It's not from your intellect. It is not from your connections. It is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. You know, the Bible says, Woe to him that puts his trust, that puts his faith in the arm of flesh. You know, when we put our faith in our connections, when we put our faith in people, when we put our faith in ourselves, we're vulnerable. We're very vulnerable to disappointment. Uh, I've told this story quite a few times of how I had an uncle very high up in government and he promised that he would arrange me to be transferred to a choice uh, 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 department, a choice location where I would be in the middle of what I wanted, to, where I would be doing what I wanted to be doing. The night before he was supposed to effect this transfer, guess what? He was fired. He was fired. My whole faith was in my uncle. My uncle would arrange it. My uncle would make it happen because my uncle had the position, he had the authority, and he had the power. Or so I thought. The night before he was going to help me, he was fired. It's not that like he didn't want to help me, but all power belongs to God. Do not be deceived. Every good and perfect gift that you have, it comes from God. You know, I read something from Rick Warren about how God grows our faith and our trust. He used the analogy of how a child learns to trust a parent through a process called the circle of security. And this is a circle that has occurred thousands and maybe even tens of thousands of times 
in the life of a child as the child grows up. The first step in the circle is the child recognizes an unmet need. He's at the bottom of the stairs and he needs to get to the top, but he cannot get there. He needs help. That's step one. The child recognizes an unmet need. I need A or B or C or D and I am unable to do it by myself. Step two is that the child expresses that need. Usually, for children, they do it by crying, by yelling, uh, mostly because at that age, they don't have words yet. Or they might actually, you know, express it in words that you understand. But somehow, they let you know. He lets you know that he's at the bottom of the stairs and he wants to get to the top. He lets you know that his diaper is soiled. He lets you know that he is hungry or he's bored. And, and, and he can't get out. You know, my daughter, my, my, my second child, when you put her in the car seat, yeah, she would cry from the moment you put her in the seat until you got to the destination. She would not stop crying. There was an unmet need that she had that we did not recognize. But when we finally recognized it, which was she didn't want to wear her shoes while she was in the car seat, once you took off her shoes, she was good. Amen? Anyway, somehow they let you know. My daughter let me know by crying non-stop. Step three, the parent meets that need. We took off her shoes. The, the, the parent pulls the child out of the crib and, and cuddles the child. They, they change the child's diaper. They, they give the child the bottle or, or feed the child. They soothe the child. They take the child up the stairs, whatever. They basically do whatever it is that the child needs to be done. So step three, is the parent meets the need. So step one, child has a need. Step two, child uh, uh, expresses the need. And step three, parent meets the need. The, the result, what happens as a consequence of the parent meeting the need is step four. And what is step four? The child learns to trust the parent. But you know what? Good parents don't always say yes all the time. Sometimes a good parent will say no. And sometimes a good parent will say, not yet, but they are driven, always driven by a love for the children and a sense of responsibility for their well-being. A responsible parent does not say yes all the time. And that is how God deals with us. But when a parent says no or not yet, the response of the child is dependent or is a reflection of the maturity of the child. When a child is young and immature, we, we understand that and we tolerate their inability to receive no or their inability to delay gratification. We, we tolerate their inability to deal with a, a not yet. But as they get older, our tolerance for such behavior is, is limited. As my children have gotten older, they haven't stopped asking for stuff. If I yesterday, one of them asked me for my, for, my, uh, for my sweatshirt. But as they have gotten older, when I say no or not yet, they do not have a meltdown because now they know that I love them. And when I say no, it means I genuinely believe this is a bad idea. And when I say not yet, they trust that it is a question of timing. My yes is not the, or, or my not yet, is not evidence of my love. My yes or no or not yet is not proof that I love you. We expect God to prove his love for us every day by giving us everything we want. When he says yes all the time, we believe he loves us. Only a self-serving and irresponsible parent says yes to everything. And we all know that. Your response to God's no or not yet is a reflection of your maturity and your confidence in the word of God. If you truly believe God loves you, loves you enough to give up the life of his son for you, then why would he say no to something that was good for you or in your best interest? Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his son, his own son, at the time, his only son, 
says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? What is God's motivation in answering our prayers? David in Psalm 69 verse 16 says, Answer me, O God, out of the goodness of your love. Everything God does for you, in you, through you, for you, he does because he is a good God. That is his nature. That is why the Bible says in Psalm 100 that God is always good. It is who he is. God's goodness is not based on your goodness. God's goodness is based on his nature. It is based on who he is. It is not based on how good you are. You need to stop thinking that God's goodness is based on how good you are. Do you know why? Because God is good to bad people. Now that's tough for us to accept. They, they breathe the same air that you and I breathe. They get to be alive. They, they even ignore him. And he's still good to them. You know, when Jesus Christ was with his, his, his disciples, and a couple of them, you know, were not happy with the response that people were, 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 were giving. They were not happy with the rejection. They were not happy with, you know, with the fact that these guys turned their backs on Jesus. You know what they said? It says, let us call thunder from the sky and strike them. That is what many of us believe we should do. Anybody who does not conform to the word of God should be dead. That is not the spirit that is in you. That is not the spirit of God. Our rush to judging people and wishing evil on people because they are bad. That is not the spirit of God. That is not the nature of God. God's goodness isn't based on your goodness. In fact, the Bible says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Who causes the rain to fall and the sun to shine, both on the believer and the unbeliever alike. And you know, that is why I have a problem with a performance-based Christianity, which is a lot of what we are hearing today. If I am good, then God will bless me. And if he doesn't bless me, it means I am not good enough. So I need to be better in order to receive the goodness of God. And you know what? That way of thinking, it doesn't lead to the goodness of God. It leads to frustration. And eventually, it leads to unbelief. I, I am certain that many of the people who have turned away from the faith have done so out of a frustration. The frustration that if I do A, B, C, and D, then God will do this for me or do that for me. But God is not compelled by your performance. God is compelled by his love. And his love sometimes requires him, compels him, demands that he says no. You know, that way of, of dealing with God, it leads to frustration. It leads to unbelief. In fact, it leads to spiritual pride. Because you start to think the reason why you are blessed is because you are good. And the reason why this person or that person is going through a challenge that you are not going through is because you are better than them. I want to encourage you, keep on living. Keep on living. The Bible says in this war, we will have challenges. It has nothing to do with how good you are. God good, God, God's goodness, my brothers and sisters, as I close, is not based on your performance or the lack of it. God is good because that is who he is all the time. He doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the same on my Sunday, on my Monday, on my Tuesday, on my Wednesday, on my Thursday, on my Friday, on my Saturday, and again on my Sunday. He is the same. He never changes. So when we say God is good, you can with confidence say all the time, and all the time, God is good because that is who he is. Goodness is not something that, that God does occasionally. Goodness is who God is. And we can be confident in his goodness.
This morning, I want us to just take a moment and pray wherever it is you are and just thank God for his goodness in your life. I know there are many things that you have forgotten. I'm, I'm not trying to take you uh, on a walk down memory lane this morning. I want you to just look at yourself right now. You have eyes that see. You have ears that hear. You have breath in your lungs and life in your limbs. Most likely, possibly, perhaps, you are sitting somewhere with a roof over your head and there's food in your refrigerator. And, and, and maybe you have lost your job, but there's an unemployment check that you can get. And maybe there's no unemployment check, but you are alive. And, and there's somebody who has offered to help. I don't know what, in what way he has been good to you, but if you look today, you will see the goodness of God. In fact, the fact that you are alive is because of the goodness of God. This morning, let's just take a moment and thank God for his goodness. Some of us need to take a walk down memory lane. Some of us need to think back at all the things that God has done for you. You know, yesterday I sat in my patio uh, putting my sermon together and I heard the sound of a mosquito. And I said to my wife, oh, let's go, let's go inside because there are mosquitoes outside. And as I went inside, I, I thought to myself, wow, the sound of a mosquito has become a rare thing. And I could actually go inside my house and escape from the mosquito. I remember a time where there was no escape from mosquitoes. And it was a constant sound in your ears. God is good, my brothers and sisters. Let's just thank him for his goodness. Let's thank him for, for his mercy. Let us just thank him for all that he has done for us. For all that he's doing for us. And for all that he will continue to do for us. Because God is good. Father, this morning we thank you. Almighty and ever living God, we bless you. We give you praise and we give you glory. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Father, for the different ways every day that you show us how good you are. We bless your holy name. In the mighty name of Jesus, this morning we give thanks. And if there's anybody here who has forgotten all the good things that God has done, who is overwhelmed by the challenge of today, and is having a hard time remembering the goodness of God. I want to pray for you wherever you are. Father, your son and your daughter, or, or your daughter, Father, is struggling right now. The challenges of today, the, the problems in front of us, Father, they, they make it difficult for us to look back and see your goodness, to look up and see your face. Almighty God, we ask that you will, in your goodness, reach out, stretch out the hand of compassion to your child and minister your love, minister your warmth, minister your embrace to this child in the name of Jesus. Let them experience your goodness again, O oh God. Remind us, O oh God, of all the different times that you have been good, that faith may arise in our hearts and we may walk through our own Red Sea, that we may cross our own Jordan to enter into the land that you have prepared for us. Thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And if there's anybody here also who has not uh, acknowledged um, Jesus as Lord and Savior, who has not received the, the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, you have not accepted that Jesus died for you. God is good all the time, but the ultimate aspect of God's goodness is a relationship with his son. But you, you enjoy that aspect of his goodness by accepting that gift that he lays before you this morning. Accepting that Jesus died and his life paid the price for all your sins. That his blood was shed to pay the price for all the things you should not have said that you said, for all the things you should not have done that you did. And in order to receive that sacrifice, that gift, all you have to do is say this prayer with me. Father, I thank you for the gift of Jesus. I thank you that you sent your son to die for me. I thank you that his life paid the price for mine, that his blood was shed to wash away, to pay the price for all my sins. Father, I accept the sacrifice of Calvary. I accept that Jesus died for me. Thank you, Father. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me a new life. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. God is good 
all the time. And all the time, God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord.